Welcome back to the Present History Podcast. We have a really exciting episode for you today, as I had the opportunity to sit down with Philip Allen, a critically acclaimed naval historian and author. We had a fantastic conversation talking about the age of sail, what life was like on one of those ships, and some lesser known stories from naval history. I thoroughly enjoyed our discussion and I cannot wait for you to hear it. So get yourself comfortable and enjoy my conversation with Philip Allen. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's a real pleasure and an honor to have you here. Now you're welcome. Uh, so would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself, uh, your life, what drew you into history and writing, and a little bit about your story? Okay, fine. Yeah, I think I've always been interested in history. Um, I was born in the 60s, so a bit older than you, Zach. <laughs> um, and... Um, it's funny, the, the the Second World War had only finished 20 years before I was born, and it was it was very much around me, you know. Uh, our kids at school had parents who'd served there. We used to find gas masks in cupboards and play with them. There were still bomb sites. And actually, it was closer than the Second Gulf War is, for example, today. So it was, so that sort of got me into history. Um, and uh, then as a kid... I began to read uh, a lot of fiction. Um, back in those days, there wasn't much on the telly, no telly in the day. So if it was raining and you couldn't be out on your bike, you know, you read. Um, I particularly liked C.S. Forrester and the Hornblower stories, which were set in this totally different world of sailing ships, fighting battles, uh, raiding. Uh, and I got very much drawn to that. I enjoyed those sort of books. I read Alexander Kent and there were various other authors at the time. So it was very much naval fiction. Um, and then later, when I went to university, I studied history because that's what I liked. Uh, and in the second year of my history degree, there was a chance to do um, 18th century naval history. So I thought, well, great. I, you know, that's wonderful. I'm going to find out you know, the background to, to, to all this stuff. And I absolutely loved it. It, was, it, was, it opened up a, a world that I'd been um yeah unaware of um and uh yeah very exciting mutinies and battles and uh but also it's a, it, it's it had its own culture um you know if you were to walk past a sailor in the street today you wouldn't recognize him you couldn't do that in the 18th century a sailor looked completely different his clothes were different <clears throat> he wore trousers that's a naval invention uh rather than breeches and stockings uh he would have tattoos they were introduced into the Navy by Cook's sailors who, who'd come across them in Polynesia uh, during his voyages, voyages of explanation, exploration, or jewellery, long uncut hair. They spoke differently. You know, they were very, very, you know, almost a race apart. So that introduced me into that world. Um, and so that was, that, uh, and that interest, when I left the university, I didn't become a writer. I actually went into the motor industry, but I still had that interest. And many years later, when I decided to try my hand at writing, um, you know, I had all the books on the shelves, yeah, I had to, to do the research. Um, and um, so I was drawn back to that. I thought, well, um, that's where my passion is. That's what I'll write about. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. So you would say that in some ways it was the fiction that inspired you or draw, drew you into a more academic interest in the subject. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, there's a lot of people who go through that route. I mean, as kids, you don't read, you know, uh, history books unless you're forced to at school. Um, and that doesn't, you know, that doesn't really, you know, that's not how you get the interest. I think most people's route is exactly that. They they read, you know, good stories set in that time. And if if it if it appeals to them in the way it appealed to me, you then want to know, well, how much of that is true and how much of that is, you know, is made up. And that mm. then draws you into into reading first-hand accounts. 
Absolutely. And it's that inspiration, right? It just takes something to inspire them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I, I think, you know, um, if you were to go into the street, for example, and stop 100 people and ask them, uh, what was a 95th rifleman's officer's uniform in the Napoleonic War? None of them would be able to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> but if you ask them, you know, what does Sean Bean wear in the shop? Yeah. You know, TV programs. You know, they'd all be able to describe it. You know, so yeah. it is. It's a it's a gateway into a time, um, and uh, that's that's the same with with naval fiction as well. Oh no! Absolutely, absolutely. So the age of sail. What are we talking right. about here? Uh, can you set the scene for us? Uh, what time period are we talking about? Okay, so um, yeah, man has uh, used ships from about five thousand years ago. So uh, almost as soon as we started to travel, we did so in boats, mm. uh, and of course, most of the the world is covered in sea. Um, the age of sail really sort of starts with the age of discovery. So Columbus, so that's, we're talking fifteenth century there. Columbus, De Gama, uh, Magellan, the, these these largely Iberian and Italian. Um, navigators who 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 took uh, uh, you know before then there'd be very little uh, European exploration. The Vikings had got to Iceland and so on, but really very little. Um, but it suddenly exploded out because of technology, uh, particularly in, in in terms of navigation, uh, but also the ships. That suddenly you could actually go around the world. You could you could go to discover new continents. So that's when it starts. Um, and it sort of get, it, it, it ends really at the beginning of the 19th century, um, particularly with the invention of the steam engine, and, you know, and, and, and uh, iron ships and, and so on. So um, the, the period I write about, which is the Napoleonic Wars, is very much um, uh, the epitome of it. You know, the 18th century was very much a naval age. Um, and the 18th century sort of starts with piracy. Um, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean, um, which was uh, which was a, is a genuine period. Uh, but then you've got um, you know all the wars with the French and Spanish, lots of naval battles, lots of lots of action. Uh, also, a lot of exploration. So Cook, uh, for example, and his uh, discover his, his voyages to the to the, um, uh, the Pacific, uh, mutiny on the bounty. You know the. The, the historical stories are, are, are just go on and on. There's so much uh, wealth of, of, of detail in that period, uh, and also it's 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 romantic. It's attractive. Mm. The ships look amazing. It, yeah. Um, you know, ironclads may have been more effective, but they're a horrible grey, you know, smoke belching smoke. You know, a sailing ship just looks looks wonderful. Not quite so romantic um, so with it's all a that smoke. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, no, amazing. So you've written elsewhere about uh, this strange combination between the claustrophobia of the ship and then the boundless seas that are just outside those wooden walls or potentially iron walls. What was life like on one of those ships? Maybe if we focus on the Napoleonic mm, era, sure. what was life like? Um. Yeah. I mean, the claustrophobia is definitely, if you go to something, I mean, the Victory, for example, in Portsmouth, you mm. visit that, um, it's 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 the biggest, it's a first rate. So it was one of the largest ship in the Royal Navy at the time it was built. Um, it's very small. I mean, it's really small. <laughs> there are frigates uh, moored up uh, in the in the dockyard next to it, which are longer. Wow. Um, the crew of the Victory was over 800. So... If you go there, and then you have to imagine eight hundred people living in that in that confinement on those three decks that are, you know, they're less than two hundred foot long and they're forty foot wide. I mean, the mass of humanity. It's not just humans. They would, when they were going on a long voyage, they would take large amounts of livestock with them. So you've got the smell of that and so on. Also, when you you visit something like the Victory. Uh, the the ports are always open and the guns are run out because they're light in a more space. That's not the case at sea. Those guns are all run in, so they're taking up a lot of space. Those ports are all shut, so it's dark and it's smelly. Um, so it really is this very intensely claustrophobic space. But then the ship itself is can be voyaging, you know, can be sailing to the Caribbean uh, or to you know to to India. So there are. 
huge voyages being made. So, yeah, it's nice from a novelist's point of view that you've got that, those two worlds, this very close world of, of, of the ship, but then it's, you know, uh, you can send that ship across the world. Um, so that, that that's attractive from a, from a creative point of view. Um, but, yeah, that, that claustrophobia, that, that feel, and it's something we don't really, you know, we don't live like that anymore. Mm. But um, you do think it must have been must have been hellish <laughs> oh yeah no absolutely such a an intense environment and then you throw in a battle into that yeah. environment yeah. where you've got the cannons you've got the wounded you've got their screams you've got blood all that kind of stuff just a really yeah. really intense environment absolutely yeah yeah no very very much so very much so yeah um also there's also another side to it though which is um the the, the lives of the sailors because mm. Huge amounts of tedium and boredom. So during the Napoleonic Wars, most warships spent most of their time either in port um, or uh, on blockade. So blockade was um, uh, through most of that period. Uh, the the main form of warfare was to preventing uh, the uh, your, your opponent trading, uh, which means essentially parking your fleet outside his ports. Um, so and being out there through winter summer gales so there would have been lots and lots of time of just day after day sailing backwards and forward backwards and forwards um waiting for uh, them to come out and, and a battle that may never happen you know wouldn't happen for years so they also had to entertain themselves um and there's a lot of you know uh, uh life on board where they're doing that you know there were dancing uh, the songs, entertaining themselves, scrimshaw, you know. Um, so they had to, because you'd go mad if you didn't didn't have some form of entertainment. So it, it it's it is a it is an interesting. It is, I find it a fascinating world. I can't imagine being in that world, yeah. but uh, <laughs> it's an interesting one to write about and observe it from the outside. Yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely. And and speaking of your writing, your book series uh, mm -hmm. follows your protagonist. Alexander Clay, and it's set yep. during the Napoleonic era, so the late yep. 18th, early 19th uh, centuries. What did naval warfare look like during that period? And following Alexander Clay, yeah. he starts as a, a first lieutenant, I believe, yep. and then kind of goes through the ranks. What did naval warfare look like during that time? Um, I think it's the first thing to say is it, it, it's very much at the end of the age of sail. So mm -hmm. the ships are. Uh, the marvels of the age. I mean, we were talking about uh, victory. Um, that wasn't a typical ship. A 74 would be a typical ship, which is a two-decked uh, uh, ship of the line. Um, that was an, you know, that was the most complicated thing the 18th century could create. Wow. Um, it took several years to build. It needed thousands of trees. Um, it would have had a crew of about 650. Um, it was a floating town. So it carried everything it needed on board. It would have coopers and carpenters and sailmakers um, and with all their tools, armourers, uh, so they could it could repair its own fabric. Uh, it said all those people, uh, it would have uh, five um, uh, boats, which it carried on as well, 100 marines, so it could appear over the horizon, land a landing force with its boats, you know, raid and then then disappear over the horizon again um and then within its hold um it would have enough uh, water and food to uh, survive for up to six months so you could send this extraordinary fighting machine um to india uh without it having to stop on more route uh, in terms of its firepower so mainly that was the guns um, the the firepower of a seventy four was it, it had a greater weight of artillery than, for example, Wellington had at Waterloo, and that's one ship. Um, you know, the Royal Navy had uh, uh, you know, several hundred ships of the line. So, in terms of fighting power, it's enormously powerful. Um, during the Napoleonic Wars, I say blockade was a lot of what they did, but I think a more interest is what some of the smaller ships did, particularly uh, some of the frigates. There's a lot of raiding. Uh, there's a lot of um, cutting out, which means uh, uh, sending in boats to to bring out a, 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 a warship by essentially boarding it at night from boats uh, to raid the shore. Um, so uh, a lot of single ship actions. So there aren't that many large fleet actions, but almost if you read a 
you know, accounts of the of the period, almost on a daily basis, there are little skirmishes um, happening, uh, you know, convoys being attacked, um, uh, lots of little battles, uh, and those, in many ways, are more interesting. Yeah, you know, yes, I do. You know, in my books, I do have some of the larger actions, but it's that that you know some of those smaller day to day actions that are that are more. Uh, yeah, the, the, the more creatively interesting. Yeah, you know, the chance for maybe a little more action or, or something like that. Mm. Well, um, interesting. Just, yeah. just one thing you said about uh, the books. Um, mm. Although uh, Alexander Clay is the main character, um, one thing I did, which which mm. C.S. Forrester and Patrick O'Brien didn't do, is is look at the the ship more as a community. So it's almost like a Downton Abbey, if you like. There's an upstairs and a downstairs. You know, there's the officers who are, you know, think they're in charge and they want it. And but then you've got the lives of the sailors. So I very much have sailor characters, and they have their own stories and their own backstories and their own activities. And they're, you know, they're up to all sorts of things. Mm. The officers think they know what's going on, <laughs> and often there's a there's another agenda entirely going on below decks. Mm. So that's quite a nice, you know, almost like a sort of. Yeah, upstairs, downstairs, um, a community within the ship, um, and there's there's lots of things you can do creatively with that. No, absolutely, and I, I love that image of the the crew as this community, as this kind of Downton Abbey esque uh, kind of thing. Um, so everyone will have heard of yeah, the battles yeah. of Waterloo, of Crimea, of um, you know those kind of larger scale battles that everyone knows about. Are there any lesser known events that you'd like to see get more recognition? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think there are. I mean, as I said, most of the fighting is is quite small scale, and there's some very famous at the time uh, captains that I mean, um, yeah, Thomas Cochrane would be an example who uh, was used by Patrick O'Brien as his Aubrey character, very much based on him. Uh, so Sidney Smith is another. Uh, Edward Pellew was probably the most famous frigate captain of the time. Uh, all of them had very active careers, never fought in a major battle. None of them did. They weren't at Trafalgar. They weren't at the Nile. They weren't at Copenhagen. Uh, and yet they were very, very active. So there's lots of characters who were doing, who, 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 who say, were, 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 were very active in the war, but weren't involved in the, in the, the, the big actions. Um, I think the other thing about the Napoleonic Wars is is um, it's the naval side of it is actually a very, very much a parallel for the for the land side. In other words, if you look at eighteenth century land warfare, it's very very um, controlled and static and linear for most of the eighteenth century, and there aren't many decisive wars. Um, or, but then along comes this chap called Napoleon who rips up the rule book. And completely changes uh, warfare forever. Um, and there's something very similar happens at sea. So 18th century naval battles are also very much the fought in lines. Um, there's a there's there's a fundamental problem with an 18th century warship, which is that it moves forward, but it fires sideways. So there's a slight crab-like way it has to go into action because it, if it sails directly towards the enemy, it can't fire. And if it if it can fire at the enemy, it, it can't get any closer. So that tended to cramp the style of it. And Nelson is is very much the person, and uh, the equivalent of Napoleon, who who tears up the rule book um, on on the naval side. So his battles are very very different. They are battles of annihilation. They're very Napoleonic battles. Um, you know, at the Nile, he he doesn't. You know, he's annoyed that four of the French ships get away. Um, and similarly at, at Trafalgar, you know, his his mantra is very much, you know, look, doesn't matter, forget the lot. You know, uh, he, in fact, he says instructions: no captain can do it very wrong if he puts himself alongside an enemy ship. Doesn't doesn't matter what the, you know. Here's the order, but if in the heat of battle, just get stuck in, you know. Um, mm. And it's it's it, it is a, there's a similar parallel that's happening. He very much revolutionizes. Um, naval warfare yeah it's fascinating and you mentioned this this parallel between the land and the sea battles uh, yeah. were there any moments where they kind of spilled over mm. into each other like a land battle directly affecting a sea battle or vice yeah. versa i think um 
it, it's often hard for uh, land-based historians to understand sea power. Mm. Um, Napoleon loses the Napoleon Wars because he he never gets control of the sea. Mm. So his most persistent opponent is Britain. He doesn't lose because he's got the uh, you know uh, the worst army. On the contrary, the French army is is brilliant. Um, it, it it could it's much larger and much more powerful than the British army. He loses because he never gets the chance to invade Britain, um, and because of that, uh, he he ultimately will lose that war. And because he's blockaded and because he cedes control of the sea to Britain, Britain. Uh, controls world trade during the Napoleonic Wars. And the money that that brings in, that huge amount of revenue, is what funds the defeat of Napoleon. It funds, you know, it funds the Russian army, it funds the Austrian army, it funds all these coalitions, and ultimately it wins the war. So there's this sort of, um, Napoleon can't see the ships, they're over the horizon, but they have this enormous effect on the course of that war. They all, but also, there are times when uh, sea power has a much closer one. And I think probably the best example of that is, is the Peninsula War, you know, 1808 to 1814, where France invades Spain, thinks it's going to be a walkover, in fact, gets embroiled in this long war. Um, Napoleon calls it his Spanish ulcer because it's just bleeding France dry. Um, and they think it'll be over uh, you know, uh, almost instantly. They'll just roll the Spanish over. They wind up in a war where there's never less than quarter of a million French troops based in Spain um, trying to hold the country down. And the reason it's such a destructive war uh, in many ways is that he chooses the worst place to fight because it's the peninsula. It's the Iberia. It's called that for a reason. You look at a map, Spain and Portugal, it's surrounded by sea. and He doesn't control the sea. Um Worse still, roads, Spanish roads are terrible. So if you want to move around and move supplies and logistics, you need to use the coast. And he doesn't control the coast. So um, worse from the British point of view, it's a great place to fight because you can land, bring supplies. You can spy the Spanish guerrillas by sea. Um, you can you can. And, and if things go badly, you can have a small British army that's much smaller than the French army that can operate there under Wellington more initially than Wellington. And when things go wrong, um, you know, where it does get outnumbered, as happens to Moore during the Corona campaign, what does he do? He skedaddles for the coast where he gets taken off by the Navy. So he's, they've got this insurance policy, which allows them to be much more bold. They couldn't do that somewhere else. You couldn't risk losing the army. But actually in Spain, you can, because you're never that far from the sea. And if you can get to the coast, you can be, you can be evacuated. So, um, and, and the role of the, 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 the Navy is, is often underestimated in that war. Um, they tie up thousands of French troops trying to defend the coast. Um, and yet the coastline is thousands of miles long and they never quite succeed. So they set up coastal batteries and lookout posts. And, you know, people like Thomas Cochrane, who, who spent six months uh, a campaign on the Mediterranean coast in a frigate, um, and he just keeps turns up over the, you know at night lands a load of marines captures a battery you know blows it up you know and before help can arrive he's disappeared again and he's down the coast and he's blowing up a bridge he's you know helping the spanish guerrillas capture a, a little fortress he's even bombards french troops on a coast road from the sea um and it's just these pinprick raids all along the coast tying up thousands of, of, of uh, French troops. And ultimately, it's, it's, it's a very costly campaign for France. Um, and there's that, there is that big name. You know, without sea power, it, it, wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have happened. Mm. No, it, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. So we, we've got the history, right? And then we bring that into writing mm -hmm. historical fiction. What does your process of research look like when you come to write one okay. of your books yeah um so uh, they they are rooted in 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 a historical background so they are um uh they're linear through time uh, so if i'm writing right okay i've got to 1801 what happened in 1801 of interest so there's basically a framework of events there'll be something happening 
that you will then want to insert your capture zone. Um, so you research that, um, and then then in some ways, I mean, first of all, you, things will come out of the research. You'll find interesting characters that you wouldn't you hadn't thought of or hadn't dreamt of. Or, um, but what you're almost looking for is the gaps in the history. In other words, there's a framework of history, but there's spaces, and it's the spaces in which you insert your your story. Um, so I would say most of my books are eighty percent of it is from in here. It's it's made up. It's fiction. Um, the rest of it is 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 based on on factual. And in fact, those those gaps are brilliant. I mean, they are sometimes you know, it's eighty oh one. So one of my books is set in eighty oh one, where there's an interesting campaign in the Baltic. So what happens is that. Uh, the Royal Navy is utterly dependent on supplies from the Baltic. Yeah, you know, hemp for ropes, canvas for uh, 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 sails, uh, spars for, uh, uh, um, for for masts, tar, all come from the Baltic. Um, and the French re- twig, finally, well, we can't defeat the Royal Navy, but maybe if we can get the Russians and the Prussians to stop supply and the Swedes and so on to stop supplying them with all the, the navies, which are the navies dependent on. So they 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 start a, a diplomatic campaign to do that. Of course, this is a, a existential threat for Britain because no navy, nothing to stop the Grand Army crossing the Channel. So a big fleet is sent to the Baltic. But ahead of it, there's a frigate is sent with a diplomat called Van Sittart, a uh, frigate called the uh, Penelope, on a diplomatic mission and it, to Copenhagen, and, and then he comes back, he fails. But then, but that's the bit you say, aha, okay, well, let's change the Penelope for the Griffin with my character Alexander Clay and all the sailors and all my other characters. Still keep Van Sittart, this diplomat, but make him more of a sort of, you know, it's a bit more espionage sent in ahead, and then you've got an interesting story in the Baltic and, uh, you know, with all sorts of things that can happen. And I'll give you an example. So, uh, not a spoiler, but the, the, the Russian Tsar is murdered during this period. He's Whoa. in a palace coup. He's strangled in his bed. Yeah. Nobody knows who did it. No That's way. the historical fact. It's unknown who did wow. it. Uh, but that is what you're looking for because, well, it was terribly convenient for the British. And yeah. uh, wouldn't it be interesting if that frigate was, you know, in St. Petersburg at the time and... You know, yeah. And there you are. You have the bones of a story. So what you found is a gap in the history. Mm. Well, that it's factually true. Tsar Paul was 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 murdered. Yeah. Nobody knows who did it. Gosh. Off we go. Yeah. No, that is that's perfect. And it strikes me that that's a way of doing it that has a lot of integrity, right? Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. um, you're not working to rewrite the historical narrative. You're actually working around it or inside no. it. You're using it. Um, and that works really well, especially yeah. if we're working yeah. off the basis that history, that historical fiction can be that kind of gateway drug, for lack of a better term, um, to yeah. the, the yeah. more academic yeah. history. Yeah, I mean, it, fundamentally, all, all fiction has to start with a really, really good story. Mm. And almost it needs to be better now than it's ever been. You yeah. know, Jane Austen had to compete with, you know, what what, what else would our readers do? A turn around the room, a walk in the garden. You know, I have to compete with Netflix. You know, <laughs> I've got to stop my readers. They've got to stay with my book and not go into, you know. So you can see it's, you, you can't. You can't. You know, it's got to be a cracking story, or it, it won't sell. I think the other thing is with historical fiction is that roughly half my audience are, are, are really into the period, and therefore, if it's wrong, they, do you know what? They they they're very they're very quick to email me and tell me. Um, so you've got to get that detail right. But then you also the other half of my uh, readers aren't aren't that much. They just they're there for the story and the color and so on and they're on that that interested and you mustn't overburden it you know so it's very tempting so you do all this research but the real trick is to decide what which bits of it you need for the story and which bits well you know i may have spent hours and hours on that but i'm going to leave that out because it will just drag the story down um you know there's too much information you don't you know so it's it's you need to be it needs to be right but it yeah. needs to be light as well mm. um so that the story can flow 
Yeah, no, 100%. And and how do you go about that process of choosing what to include, what not to include? Are there things where you just draw the line and like, nope, I can't alter that, I can't change that? Or where are the areas you're more willing to compromise? Do, do you know, I mean, one of the strange things is that you you sometimes you uh, you come across historical things. You just you think, well, that happened, mm. but it's so bizarre, no one's going to believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you quite frequently you have to dumb down the, the, yeah. the, the, the historical events because they're just they're just so good. Amazing. There's an example in Patrick O'Brien where he uh, he uses in, in in his first book he uses a uh, one of Thomas Cochrane's famous victories, which is uh, over a Spanish frigate called the El Gamo. Now, he was on a little sloop with four pounder guns. Uh, you know, a four pounder cannonball was about that big. You know, th- this is not a proper naval gun at all. Uh, and uh, he captures, a, 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 he's got 54 crew on board, including himself. Uh, and he captures a, a, a British, a Spanish frigate with over 300 crew. Uh, and 32 guns, decent guns as well. So it's, and it's one of these, he surprises it and the various reasons why it happened. Um, and you look at it and you just think, I can't, I can't put that in a book. No, no one will believe it. <laughs> they just won't. They just won't. You know, just, just, just make it, make it bigger. <laughs> well, the Spanish one's smaller, you know, but you can't. So there is a lot, there's often things like that. Where you just think, you know, that's a great story, but. You know, no one will believe it, so I'll I'll leave it. So, funnily, you wind up with fiction. That's all. Also, I mean, you're not, you know, I mean, if you if you research, uh, most warships during the Bunny War spent half their time in port. You know, wow. my ships don't because yeah. that's not interesting. <laughs> you know, people don't read it for you know, if 150 pages of life in Plymouth. <laughs> Follow my bit of action. That that yeah. wouldn't wash. <laughs> no absolutely and and you've spoken about creating this community of characters how do you go about yeah. creating those characters do you find real yeah. people and say oh i like that part of about them i like that bit of their story how, what does your character creation process look like um the, yeah i mean in terms of characters they're all fictitious and i mm. and i bet them i think it's not it's not that difficult. I think um, the thing about history is it's closer than you think. Um, so, you know, the Napoleonic Wars, they seem very distant. Um, do you know when the last survivor of Napoleon's old guard died? No, I don't. 90, 1904. Wow. So he lived to see the motor car, you know. Uh, sorry, he was alive in 1904 because I've got an interview with him. He's a Polish guy. No he joined way. in 1796. Uh, as he, he was born in 1796, he lived in three centuries. He joined in 1812 uh, for the um, the Polish Lancers for the campaign in Russia. So he was at Waterloo. He was at the retreat from Moscow, Borodino, uh, and in 1904 he was 108 and still alive. And he was interviewed um, and quite lucid. So he may have lived even longer. So you know. Although it seems very distant, it's often closer to us than we think. Um, and often, I think, if you, you know, biologists will tell you, evolution doesn't happen in two or three generations. It happens over thousands of years. People were fundamentally the same in, you know, in the Napoleonic Wars as they were today. The things that motivated them, yes, they had different beliefs. Yes, they were, you know, they spoke differently and so on. But fundamentally, fear is fear. Love is love. Hate is hate, you know. They weren't that much different than us, you know. Uh, and you know, the more you look at history, I find the, the, the more similarities you find than differences. Um, there's a good example. If, if you go to the London Museum, um, there's a in the medieval section. It's a great museum, by the way. In the medieval section, there's a big display of uh, pins, badges, little wire, really cheap, nasty, tacky wire badges that people used to put on their cloaks. Most of them have a sword on them. And um, basically pilgrims used to do pilgrimages to uh, to Canterbury, to um, to the tomb of Thomas Beckett. And when they came out, they were all excited. Oh, I've seen this amazing tomb. And there's, uh, there's, and there's a load of guys there selling these cheap, nasty wire badges. 
probably for far too much money. And they, they buy one, they put it and they took it back to show everyone. It's a fridge magnet. It's a fridge magnet. It's a medieval fridge. You know, the motivation of someone going there was exactly the same as the motivation of someone going to the Eiffel Tower today. They come up, oh, there's someone buying, selling tap. I'll, I'll buy one of those to take yeah. home and stick on my fridge. You know, people aren't that different. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And what I love about history is that that thing that you mentioned, that history is, is far more present uh, than we might realize. And oftentimes we can yeah. actually relate yeah. to people who live 200, 300, 400 years ago more than we give it credit for a lot of the yeah. times. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that, that's, that's very true. Yeah, yeah. So that then, that, that, that's your way in, really. Mm. Um, you know, you think, well, what would you have done in that situation? You know, if yeah. you were that sort of person, what would you have done? do that yeah absolutely like that. absolutely absolutely so we've we've spoken about um you know historical fiction as a, as a kind of gateway drug yeah. to more academic history how important do you think it is that people are engaging with historical yeah. fiction alongside the academic history I, yeah i think it's very important because it pays my mortgage but apart from that, <laughs> no, I, I think you don't understand the world if you don't understand history. Yes. I think we are, as you said, the past is much closer than you think. Mm. In the Ukraine war, you know, you, it, it's very easy to paint it as a simple, you know, the Russians invading Ukraine. And then you don't understand why Russian people don't necessarily think like that. Well, why aren't they so outraged? Well, because... You know, the history of Ukraine isn't quite as straightforward as as it's portrayed. And if you understand that, then you you, you know you're 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 a master of your history, you're not a not a not a not a slave. And, and that's that's really important. In in our own in British history is the same. I mean, I was I was taught a very you know um, Whiggish view of history at school. It was all you know, it was all battles and kings and queens and so on. But actually, beneath the surface, there's a very different history going on. Um, and actually, when you look into it, you, you, you know, that's often more interesting. For example, I, I, I have a um, uh, in the second of my books, I introduce a black character because the second one is set in the Caribbean. And it's it's at the time just building up to abolition. So I thought, well, OK, that whole slavery thing, there's, a, there's something interesting going on. And the way I was taught the abolition, you know, the slavery came to the end was it was all oh, it was all in the House of Parliament. It was, you know. Um, it was uh, these evangelical Christians part, you know, debating and passing bills and so on. And when you think about that, you think, OK, so were people on the plantations just sitting around waiting for that committee to recommend? And uh, no, of course, they weren't. They were they were liberating themselves. Um, and so there was a there were a lot of, you know, there's a lot of that lot of, uh, going on. And then also there's a whole economic strand to it as well. So. Um, you know, where actually you've got people like, you know, you've got the Wealth of Nations, uh, you know, Adam Smith and the birth of economics has just been published. One of the things he's, he's scathing about slavery in there. He says it, it, nothing moral about it. It doesn't work. You know, why, why, why are you, you know, the, the cost of, of enslaving people and having to feed them and house them and, you know, overseers to force them to do something. Why don't you just liberate them and pay them? They'll be far more productive, you know. So there's, there's so there's lots of sort of things. There. So you try and build all those. So I have a plantation owner who's decided to do that. Uh, I've got, you know, there's a there's a I have a I have a, a, a surgeon who's a real evangelicist, and then a slave who liberates himself. Um, and one of the ways that they would do it is is um, slaves would try and get to a Royal Navy warship because under English common law. Uh, you, slave, there was no such thing as slavery. Um, and whereas in the local legislations on the island, there was. So if you could get to somewhere where English common law applied, you became free. Now, that meant you got to get home to England, you got to get back to England, which is quite difficult if you're in you know, Barbados. But if you got to the deck of a Royal Navy warship, you were you effectively were no longer a slave. And as most of the ships were um you know we're, we're always on demand the captain was quite you know a nice fit bloke wants to volunteer do you know what i think we'll have him um so there was there was a very much interest in the navy turning a blind eye to this so you wound up with with um 
large proportions of the, the, the crews out there being ex-slaves. Um, and I think that's quite an interesting story. So I, so I introduced a character who, who's, uh, um, yeah, who's, a, who's a one slave. And in fact, he's become quite an important character for the rest of the novels. Um, but um, And the Navy was very cosmopolitan. That's one of the things that was different between life ashore. You know, if you were bought you were if you were in a uh, brought up in an 18th century village you know you probably married someone from the village you know you you would easily have spent all your life there not see anything navy is totally different if you look at the uh the crew lists of of warships the nationalities are just phenomenal you know there are people from all over the world from india from you know america you know, caribbean you know huge numbers of the Baltic people, so it was a real melting pot of different cultures, um, and that's actually um, if you're ever in Trafalgar Square, uh, go and have a look at the bottom of um, Nelson's Column. There are four plaques around it, big bronze plaques uh, showing his various victories. Have a look at the one for Trafalgar. Uh, there are thirteen characters in there. One of them is clearly a black guy. Um, and he's there. The, the 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 man who made the the sculptures is an Irish sculptor who very much researched it and spoke to people. And he's clear, he's got most of the detail right. And he's clearly, you know, he's been told. Well, actually, a lot of the the crew were black. So he's okay. I've got this black guy, and he's got quite a prominent role as well. He's not, you know, he's he's actually pointing out to a marine where the shots come from. You know, he's there saying, you know, it's the bloke up there that because there's Nelson dying at the front. And um, so, yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. And in the 18th century Navy, um, you yeah, know, there were black officers. Um, and in fact, there was even a black post captain um, uh, um, who, uh, a chap called Jack Perkins, who almost certainly started life as a slave wow. and wound up as a, as a captain of a frigate. Wow. Wow, no, it's it's fascinating and it's really interesting to me to engage with such culturally relevant issues yeah, uh, in yeah, this way, yeah, you know, exactly. with the Black Lives Matter yeah, movement, yeah. the taking down of the Colston statue, yeah, engaging yeah, with yeah. such culturally yeah. relevant issues in the space of fiction is really interesting because it brings it all to life and helps people to engage with history that they might not have engaged yeah, with absolutely. before, yeah, might not yeah, even yeah. known yeah, before. Yeah, very much so, yeah. Yeah, yeah and... So it's something that I'd love to to talk about, if if you don't mind, uh, is you have dyslexia, uh, and you're a prolific writer. Yeah. Um, what is there any sort of advice that you would give to someone who might have dyslexia but wants to be a writer? Um, what would your advice, your best practices, your your thoughts be on that? Um, this is a conversation I I, I have with my daughters because they both have it as well. Which I'm, unfortunately. I busted onto them along with my good looks <laughs> um i think the, the the key thing to say is um if you think it's a weakness then it's a weakness uh, think of it as a strength um yes it, it, it holds me back in some ways but uh dyslexic dyslexic people are surprisingly creative in fact if you look at creative industries actually novelists as well there are you know i know lots of dyslexic novelists um, but also creative people generally. Um, and there's something about dyslexia that makes you more, more um, uh, creative. Um, you know, I see uh, my, my stories as pictures. I see them in my head and I describe them what I see. Um, and that's quite common of dyslexics. They tend to be much more uh, visual. Um, and so use that. Use that as a strength. Um, don't let it hold you back. You know, write the stories, use that creative element, and just make sure you've got a bloody good editor. Um, when at the end of the day, and and you know, that's that's what I do. I've got a really good editor, um, and she's great, and she she sorts out. I mean, you can manage it to some extent. You know, I've got a great big list here actually. When I come to edit my book, I, when I first go through them, and I've literally just listed all the words I know I'll get wrong. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, uh, below and bellow, one with two L's on the other, you know, I know they'll be all the way right, right the way through. So, you know, fortunately, because you, you know, you, you, on my, you know, on word, you can search for a word and go all the way through it. You know, it's a bit tedious, but you can, you know, look at it and say, right, is that, is that below or is that bellow? You know, and yeah. Um, so there's a certain amount you can manage it, but 
uh, key things don't let it hold you out and, and actually but see it as a strength see it as a strength you're lucky you know those people who haven't got dyslexia don't see the world as creatively as you do and use that as your strength mm-hmm. um and that that that's that, that's that's my advice to anyone you know if you've got a story to tell tell the story yeah no absolutely i think that's fantastic advice you know and and i think that it's it's really inspirational as well kind of shifting a mindset from yeah something that you might consider a weakness yeah. it can actually be a strength you can use it you can utilize yeah. it you can yeah, yeah, grow yeah, in yeah. it um you know i think that's that's yeah. fantastic has, advice. there's two sides to everything mm-hmm. yeah and it's um, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah no exactly exactly well you probably get this question all the time, uh, given your area of expertise. But the film Master and Commander, what are your thoughts? Um, Is it good? Is it accurate? What do you think of the film? It's a cracking film. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, no, very much so. Um, um, Yeah, I I, I, I think what I liked about it, going right back to where we started about, you know, that claustrophobia and the Mm. the wide open spaces, does that really well. Yeah. Yeah, It really, you really do feel, you know, the bits where the... The storyline of the the midshipman who's who's everyone the, the crew decide is a Jonas that you know everyone very close and you know that the dark gloomy interiors I think that it does that brilliantly um, and I think it, it it gets the spirit of Patrick O'Brien quite well because really Patrick O'Brien books are I don't know if you've read them but the the main thing in them is that there is the relationship between two characters. Um, uh, which is the Doctor uh, Matarin, which is which is played by Peter Bettany, I think. In the is it Paul Bettany? Anyway, Bettany in the in the, and then the Russell Crowe character, which is Jack Aubrey, who are very different, uh, but they sort of, but despite that, they get on. Um, so it, it does all of that. I mean, it's a bit of a it, it's <laughs> they really cherry pick the best bits out of several novels. So uh, no, I, I liked it, and I certainly in terms of its accuracy, I thought it was pretty good. He got the feel of the period across very well. Um, Patrick O'Brien, um, I mean, one of the things when I first read him, uh, I, I was amazed because you start reading, if you, when you start reading him, you realise he writes an 18th century dialogue. People speak uh, 18th century. And initially you think, oh, hang on a minute, this is, you know, sort of like reading Jane Austen. Um, and it takes a while for your head to get into it. But, but, but then when you do, it's, Great, you don't see it anymore, and it, ma- it, it, it makes it feel much more uh, authentic. And that's something I do with mine as well. I, you know, in terms of the dialogue, that me, the narrator, is twentieth century, but the, you know, as soon as people start speaking, they 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 they're, they're speaking eighteenth century di- dialogue. It's hard to do, uh, but again, you know, I, I, I'm working on my tenth novel now in that series, so I've actually, you know, I can switch the eighteenth century here. And you, you you do have to be careful because there are a lot of words that you might use that you think are okay and, and actually they're much later. You know, um, so for example, you can't so you can't have someone asking, um, you know, do you have any news? News was invented in the mid nineteenth century by uh, uh, an American editor putting the cardinal points together to make a actually to win a bet, I think. But anyway, it, it's a it's it's not an 18th century. So you'd say, oh, do you have your know, intelligence or word? Has word come off? You know? So you just got to change it a little bit. But uh, mm. yeah, so so that's um, um, I've got a question now. <laughs> I've rambled on a bit. <laughs> no, 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 you're all good. You're all good. No, it, it is interesting because it's those little things that can, in some ways, make or break. Commander. Sorry, that's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But those little things that can make or break the production sometimes. Um, so, as a final mm-hmm. question to you, um, is there anything that you've learned now, uh, throughout your career, throughout the process of, of learning and growing, that you would want to let your younger self know uh, at the Ooh, beginning of the process? Uh, leave the motor industry earlier and start writing because it's what you <laughs> sure. really enjoy doing. Yeah, would be one. Um, uh, I think the other one, though, is I think that proximity, that point mm-hmm. about you know how close the past is um you know i think that's that's the one that it's not you you do sort of yeah i see it in my own too i remember one of my daughters was doing uh uh o-level history and she was doing the nazis so uh anyway and she clearly thought this was something that happened ages and ages you know uh, hundreds of years ago you know back in the black and white world um and um so i, I said well look, just to 
kick you off you know i've got the um a the um on dvd the uh world at war series from the 1950s or 60s I, anyway it's it, the famous bbc one they did and they really they, they cleaned them up and did them and the very first one is about the rise of the nazis so i played it to her she was that fabulous because there's loads and loads of color footage of hitler um there's a famous bit in the in the eagle's nest where he's playing with a dog with you know, with his girlfriend and and uh, yeah, and so on. And suddenly it was, oh my goodness, it's you know, that's that's that could have been shot yesterday, you know. Yeah. And and so that was that was real, you know, for her. And I, it was something that seemed, you know, oh yeah, yeah, incredibly distant. Suddenly becomes, oh my, that's much closer. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think that's the the other thing I, I tell myself is you know, it's, it's a lot closer than you think. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's fantastic advice for anyone that wants to engage with history and a good mindset yeah. to have yeah. as a historian that history is, is far more present than you might realise. Well, Philip, thank you so You're much welcome. for your time. It's been a real pleasure to have you on the podcast. Uh, yeah, thank you so You're much. You're more than welcome. Take care. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Present History Podcast. If you want to find out more about Philip and his work, you can check out his website and you can buy his books. I highly recommend the books to you. They are fantastic. You can follow him on social media as well. All the links will be in the description and in the show notes. So never fear, you can find them all there. Make sure to follow Present History on all social media as well to keep up to date with all the exciting things that we have coming. Thank you again for listening to this episode and we'll see you in the next one.